What's up? I'm AJ and welcome back to Gen Z Garage. In today's video, we're going to be reassembling the bottom of the engine by putting all of these parts, including these new bearings, into the engine. But before we begin, I'd like to tell you what tools I'm going to be using. In the last video, we talked about planning ahead for a successful engine rebuild. The link to that is in the upper right of the video. But what I didn't mention is the tools you're expected to have in order to properly reassemble everything. Some of the most critical tools you'll need include a set of torque wrenches. Almost everything related to the engine requires the bolts to be torqued to a specific setting. You may need up to three torque wrenches for this. A smaller torque wrench that can handle pound inches. You'll use this primarily for smaller bolts such as is used on the oil pan, timing cover, and valve cover. A medium-sized torque wrench that handles a range of 5 to 75 foot-pounds. This will be used for the majority of bolts on the engine from brackets to rod caps to the cam retainer. And finally, a large torque wrench that can handle a higher range from 50 to 250 foot-pounds. You'll use this for torquing down the cylinder head bolts as well as the flywheel bolts. Next, we need a piston ring compressor. There are several kinds available, but we've chosen to use the ratchet type. These compress the springs enough so that you can slide the piston into the combustion chamber. You may want to also get the piston installation hammer, but a rubber or plastic hammer handle will also work in place. Next, we're also going to need rod bolt protector sleeves. These are critically important in ensuring that your newly assembled pistons do not scrape and damage the crank journals while you're installing them. Everything else for engine reassembly can be done with common garage tools so long as everything has already been properly machined and within specification. We'll start the engine assembly by putting together the pistons. The Iron Duke uses pressed in wrist pins, so we have a machine shop do that for us. We'll be installing properly matched piston rings for our 40 overboard pistons. The easiest way to do this is to use a vise. Carefully clamp the piston in the vise as I'm doing here. You don't want to damage the connecting rod or the piston itself, so be sure to use a shop rag to protect everything from scratches. The vise doesn't need to be tight, just enough to prevent the piston from falling out and ensuring it's snug while you install the rings. For the Iron Duke, the standard configuration pistons use a total of five rings in the assembly, which is shown on the diagram to the right. The top and second top rings are what are known as compression rings. These are the rings that seal the combustion chamber and help to maintain compression for the combustion process. The next three rings include the top and bottom oil ring, which sandwich the oil ring spacer. As oil is splashed onto the cylinder walls, these rings scrape and return the oil back into the oil pan to limit oil being burned in the combustion process. When installing the rings, start with the bottom most ring first and work your way to the top. Don't rush, this is not a hard process, but you want to make sure you protect the ring from getting bent. When properly installed, the ring should be able to spin freely. As shown in the diagram to the right, you'll want to make sure that when installing the rings, the ring gaps are properly spaced apart. This is critically important to maintain engine compression and limit blow-by. Having all of the ring gaps too close together, or worse, in a perfect line from top to bottom, would cause significant blow-by. Oil would be drawn into the combustion chamber on the intake stroke, burned, and the exhaust then forced into the crankcase, which would blow out all of the oil seals. So, make sure that before installing the pistons, the rings are properly spaced as shown. With the pistons ready, I now turn my attention to the crank. It's important to ensure that everything is exceptionally clean, so first I clean the cylinder walls with a dry rag, flip it over, and then clean each of the crank bearing surfaces. Even though we'll be installing bearings, the tolerances are such that dirt under a bearing can create a pressure point which can lead to premature failure. I cannot emphasize this enough, you can never be too clean in the engine rebuild. With the surface clean, I begin installing the crank bearings. I went with a set of molly crank and rod bearings. These get installed on the block dry and have little tabs to ensure proper orientation. Make sure you install the bearing on the correct side. As shown here, the non-bearing surface side will be stamped to indicate either top or bottom. Bottom meaning on the caps and top meaning on the block. 
Essentially, the block side bearing will have holes to allow oil to pass through, whereas the one on the cap will not. It takes effort to screw this up, so don't get stressed here. I then carefully tap down the bearings with a rubber mallet to ensure they sit flush with the block surface. Next, I apply engine assembly lubricant on the bearing to crank surface. Don't be scared to use plenty here. Assembly lube is meant to be highly sticky so that it doesn't drip away like normal motor oils. This is to prevent a dry start on the initial startup. With the block side crank bearings installed, I install the crank. I'll now focus on the main cap assemblies. These bolts have been cleaned and will be reused. As I install each crank cap, I place them in the order that they were originally installed. As mentioned, these are numbered in the casting, so it's impossible to screw this up. The rearmost bearing cap can only be installed in one place, so you can use that one to set both the numbering and orientation for the rest if you need to. For the rear bearing cap, you'll want to add a very little bit of compression RTV sealer between the cap and the block to prevent any leaks or oil seepage. I then hand tighten each of the bearing cap bolts. I go in reverse order first until I feel the bolt drop into the threads and then hand tighten the bolt until snug. This is to make sure I don't accidentally cross thread or damage the bolts. When installing the bolts, remember that one of them has a stud on the end. This bolt needs to be in the correct slot as it is used to affix the oil pump pickup tube as shown in the image. Hopefully you save the original compression nut as this will be reused too when we install the oil pump. With the caps installed and hand tightened, I gently use a rubber mallet to properly set the caps into the block. Once they're seated, I then use a normal wrench to take up any slack in the bolts before I begin torquing them down. We'll now need to torque down these bolts to the proper torque specification. We'll use our intermediary torque wrench to handle the crank caps. We start off by torquing the main caps to 35 foot-pounds. There is no specific order that needs to be followed, but it is generally a good idea to do the center cap first and then work your way outwards, alternating to each side. I then torque the crank down a second time to the final torque specification of 65 foot-pounds. With the crank installed and torqued down, we can now begin installing each piston. I use a ratchet style piston ring compression sleeve and begin installing the piston. I previously installed the rod bearing and pre-lubricated it with assembly lube. The rod bolts have been covered using protector boots. This protects the crank journal from being damaged as the piston is slid down into the combustion chamber. Damaging the crank journal at this point could significantly reduce the life of the engine or lead to catastrophic engine failure. With the piston placed in the cylinder hole, I begin hammering it down through the sleeve using my piston hammer. I then flip the engine and slowly rotate the crank until the respective crank journal drops into the connecting rod of the piston that I just installed. Next, I take the connecting rod end cap with the other end of the bearing already installed, lubricate it, and install it. I then hand tighten the connecting rod end cap bolts. We'll torque these down later. I repeat this process for the other three pistons. Remember in my engine disassembly video that I engraved the piston number in the order that they were originally installed. While this isn't totally mandatory for the Iron Duke, this is how the engine was balanced originally and rebalanced at the machine shop so it'll ensure longevity in this engine. Another important thing to remember is that the pistons must be installed in a specific direction. The piston will typically have an indicator as shown here. With the four pistons now installed, I can begin torquing down each of the end cap bolts. The manual calls for 32 foot-pounds, but I've chosen to first torque them down to 20 foot-pounds. There is no specific order this needs to occur, so you want to do both bolts for each piston before moving on to the next one. With all the bolts torqued to 20 foot-pounds, I retorque them all to the final 32 foot-pounds as called for in the shop manual. The last part of the short block rebuild will be installing the new roller cam shaft. The machine shop has already professionally installed new cam bearings and already pressed on my new aluminum timing gear. Once again, I begin by cleaning the installed cam bearings with a clean dry cloth. 
I want to eliminate any dust or dirt before I install the new cam. Next, I will pre-lubricate the cam bearings with engine assembly lube. I'll also lubricate the cam before I install it, but it helps to lubricate the bearings first since I can easily access them. With everything ready, I begin installing the camshaft. I carefully slide the camshaft into the engine, making sure that I don't gouge or scratch the journals as I slide them into place. I can access the camshaft inside the engine, so I use that to help me guide it into the final cam bearing slot. <laughs> I'm excited, but still have more work to do. I now need to make sure that the cam is correctly aligned with the crank position. Both the camshaft gear and the crankshaft gear have indicator dots that must be aligned as shown in my completed image above. There's no way to get this wrong because the timing gears only go on one way, so when the dots align, it's good to go. Finally, we need to install the cam retaining bolts. Before the timing gear was pressed onto the cam, we installed a bushing and a cam retaining plate. The two bolt holes can be accessed through the two holes in the cam. I reused the old bolts and tor torqued this down to 90 pound inches. With that, my short block has been successfully reassembled. I'm so excited to have been able to do this by myself and I'm looking forward to getting it back to the car. I appreciate everyone who has taken an interest in my project and although I'm behind in my videos, there's a sneak peek of what the completed engine looks like right now. Stay tuned for the next video where I reassemble the top end, install all the other drivetrain components, and finally paint it. <laughs>